declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings on our life. We thank you for the word of God and the privilege that we have to have it within our grasp. Read it every day, study it, learn it. We pray that you remind us the importance of dependent upon you today in our everyday life and all that we do and all that we say. And even as a church, that we as a church depend upon you as well and seek to let you work in a great and powerful way in our lives and help us reach those who need you so much. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've often spoken to Charles Spurgeon. He was considered one of the greatest preachers in the history of the church. Um, He began pastoring the Metropolitan Tabernacle at the tender age of 19 and uh, stayed there until he died. Uh, It is said that thousands were gathered together on a Sunday morning to hear him preach. If they couldn't get get into buildings, they had the windows open. They all sat around surrounding the building to hear the gospel being preached. Um, He was a man committed to Christ. He wrote many books that are still published today. One's called The Soul Winner, about how to win people to Christ. Another one's about how to preach. Um, He's also written two devotionals called Morning by Morning and Evening by Evening. They're still published today. They're still very powerful teachings that he uses in a great way. Part of his attitude was surrendering to Christ. I remember reading a story where he was offered $50,000 to come to America and to preach in 50 different cities every week. And he said, no, thank you. I have more important work to do here in England. I'm that interested in making $50,000. That's a lot of money back in the 1800s. But you see, his mindset was, I'm just here to do what God wants me to do. I'm not worried about notoriety. And this is one thing he said, and I think it's very important. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, coals without fire. We are useless. And I think that's absolutely 100% true. Paul, I believe in this chapter, is talking to this people in Corinth about what a real church is supposed to be, what church is supposed to be like, what it is, what it's supposed to be doing. In chapters 1 and 2, we've seen that the church is real people. And people who are different in many different ways, spiritual wealth, we've seen all these things. But here in chapter 5, chapter 2, 1 to 5, we see there are people who are dependent upon the Spirit of God. We are people who are fully independent of the Spirit of God. If we don't depend upon Him, then basically what we have here is a social club to come and interact with each other. That is not what the church is. The church is a spiritual, powerful group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish the mission that God has sent us here. And we must learn to fully depend upon him completely and totally. Paul did that in his ministry. Look, look what he says right in the beginning. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring you the testimony of God. He says, okay, think back to the time when I came to you. Corinth, one of those cities that was a, a, a seaport. It was a commercial city. One of those places that Paul wanted to plant a church in because people were going in and out all the time. And the goal would be to help not to people of Corinth, share the gospel, would share the gospel with people who would then take it to other cities. He saw it was very important. It was a city that was full of debauchery, immorality, idolatry. So he came there and he says, when I came to you, I did not come to you and try to weave together a wonderful tale of oratory to convince you to believe in Jesus. The word speech there means the content of what he's saying. The word wisdom speaks of the capability or the skills of mankind to weave together words so they become very persuasive and get them to believe. He said, when I came to you, I didn't come to you as a fancy orator and sat down and figure out how to say things in such a way that you would be convinced of something and it would, the reason why you got convinced was because of what I said, the way I put it. He says, I didn't want you to believe me because of my skills as a talker. I wanted you to believe me because of the message I shared with you. And make no mistake, Paul was trained in the seats of the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a, a rabbi who was very skilled in wisdom and understanding and discernment. He even gave some talk in Acts 
in reference to how to handle the new disciples in Christ, and he was very well respected. I think Paul was very well trained in the philosophies. He knew how to put an argument together. We can see that clearly in the book of Romans as he logically spells out the plan of salvation. He had the capability and the skills to come and plan all his teachings out. But he says, when I came to you, I did not want to have that happen to you because I did not want you to believe because of my skills as a teacher. I wanted to believe the message I gave unto you, Jesus Christ himself. And you know, don't make any mistake about it. Great orators can do great things. They inspire us to do a lot of things. They can speak, and, and we may be against them when they start speaking, but when they're finished, we're going, let's go. That's how it works many times. Um, Winston Churchill is one of the greatest uh, speech makers and speech writers. I didn't know this, but believe it or not, he received a Nobel Prize in literature because he wrote his own messages. He wrote his own speeches. And he was used in a great way um, in England against World War II. One person described Churchill by saying, he managed to combine the most magnificent use of English with an incredibly powerful delivery. He once said, of all the talents bestowed upon men, none is as precious as the gift of oratory. He who enjoys it well is a power more durable than that of a great king. And he's right. Uh, I'll talk about another great. Martin Luther King was a tremendous speaker or orator, uh, giving speeches that are well known, the I Have a Dream speech. And one of his lines that we use many times, which unfortunately our culture has forgotten, his dream was that people would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Don't you wish that way it was in America today? Interesting how it's completely flip-flopped since Martin Luther King was there. I don't have down here, but Ronald Reagan was another one of the. He was considered the great communicator. He's one of those individuals who would come on television and speak to American people about a project, about something they're going to do in government. And when they were opposed to him, when he came against, by the time he finished, they were on his side. He had a unique way of communicating something that just made you want to stand up and shout and say, let's go for it, buddy, let's work. They, they had skills, and there are many people that are like that. And Paul was like that, but he said, you know, when I came to you, I did not come to you with a skilled oratory because I did not want you to believe because I persuaded you by my skills. In fact, he says, I determined to know anything among you, not to save Jesus Christ and crucified. The word determined means this is my resolution. When I came to this city, this is what I resolved to do. I, I want to declare to you the testimony of God, the witness of God, but my whole purpose in doing was to do one thing and one thing only, to tell you about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you on the cross. That's all I want to talk about. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Remember earlier on he talked about how that message was not a popular message to proclaim in that culture? Um, today the cross is a symbol of hope, a symbol of life to us. We wear it around necklaces and so forth like that. But in that day, the cross was not a symbol of anything but death, a symbol of humiliation, a symbol of defeat, a symbol of a criminal. To the Jews, stumbling block. They're taught, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. How can Messiah be hanging on a tree and die? That makes no sense to them. The Greeks looked at that as uh, this is for the worst of criminals. How could Jesus be crucified and that be the son of God? And so when he came to that city, he said, I didn't come to you trying to weave it all together and convince you with my skilled oratory that Jesus is the Son of God. He said, I just wanted to declare you a simple, simple message, a message that's not well received anyway, but a message that needs to be heard. And I'm just going to tell it very simple as I could. That's all he said. He went into the city and told them about how the reality is sin, how sin separates us from God, and how we can't get rid of the sin on our own. We need a Savior, that Savior is Jesus Christ. He died upon the cross, paying the full wage of our sin. He rose again from the dead, possessing life now and forever. And he says, and, and the way to get that life is you just believe in Jesus Christ. It wasn't complicated. It wasn't difficult. Simple, simple message. But it's the same simple message we desperately need today in America. Don't need great oratory. Don't need great... Sermon making, we just need simple message of gospel truth. That's all it is. A woman named Catherine Henke was born in 1834 in England. She followed Jesus Christ and worshipped him. She became very, very sick, almost to the point where she was close to death. And I'm assuming that as she was facing that moment in time, she thought about more than anything else, the love of God and sending his son and how she had life, knowing that maybe if I leave, leave this existence, I know I'm going to be in heaven. And, but she recovered. And when she did, she wrote these words, which I think we need to hear all the time. This is what she said. Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. 
Tell me the story simply as to a little child, for I am weak and weary and helpless and defiled. Tell me the same old story when you have cause to fear that this world's empty glory is costing me too dear. Yes, and when that world's glory is dawning on my soul, tell me the old, old story Christ Jesus makes thee whole. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I don't care how modern we get in our world of today, we can never forget the old, old story. Because it may be old in the sense of time, but it's not old in the sense of reality. Jesus is the one that can transform a life completely and totally. And I would gladly trade all the technology we have today, all the iPads and iPhones, all the computers, if we just would come back to one simple truth, believe on Jesus Christ. That's it. That's all we need. Simple story, nothing complicated, and that's what we need to share over and over again. That's what Paul burdened when he came to the city. He said, this is what I came for. And, and, and that was his desire, and, and now he explains, this is what I achieved and accomplished in verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Again, it's interesting for him to say that, weakness, fear, and trembling. He, he's, he's explaining what's really going on in the soul. Weakness means I just have a sense of... Um, no power, I just, I just feel weak. I feel incapable of doing this great task to, to approach this city and to approach these people who are lost and to share the gospel with them. He says, I didn't feel like I could do this. It was a sense of real understanding of how weak I am. The fear of trembling means that he, he was really literally um, shaking in his boots as it might be to try to share the gospel with them. Not, not the fact that he was ashamed of the gospel, but because he had such a tremendous burden to see them hear the gospel and respond to it. He understood that I'm just a vessel and I don't want to mess up in my story. I just want to do something that's something great for God. Um, you know, I understand it perfectly. I mean, you know, I've told you before that when I was in high school and my first year in college, more or less, probably the second year too, um, I was terrified to stand in front of speaking people. Terrified. I can't explain to you any better than that. Literally terrified. First time I preached, my knees were shaking as fast as they could shake. I could not stop them. Terrified. And I, you know, I've been here 11 years, so I don't feel quite as terrified and quite as anxious. I don't feel weakness and trembling and fear all the time, but I still do fear a sense of apprehension every time I get up here. Um, I shouldn't tell you my little secret. If you pay attention to me sitting over here, I take a deep breath usually. In the last song, because I'm trying to calm myself down. That's how I calm myself down. Whew, easy, take it easy. And I'm praying in the last hymn that God takes my heart, my heart and give my life, because there's a sense of still weakness and trembling. It's not because necessarily I'm terrified to be up here anymore, since I've done this so much in my life. It's the fact that I know that I'm bringing forth the message from God's truth, and I don't want to mess it up. And, and I told my wife, you know, take a lot out of me. I, I know you don't realize and understand that, but they really tear me up inside, because um, I know that perhaps at the funeral, there are going to be people sitting out there that I have never met before in my life, and I don't know where they are in reference to their eternity, and this may be the only time they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And usually at a funeral, they're thinking more about it than any other time. And so when I'm preparing and working, I'm praying all the time that somehow help me to share something that would make sense to them and not mess it up with my foolishness and my mess up skills or whatever it might be. Let me just present it simply and truly as I could. I don't get much sleep the night before. My stomach's all a big mess. I know you don't understand that. I know you probably say, well, you don't look like that when you're up there, but that's because the Spirit's working on me, okay? But my wife can tell you what it's like before it comes. And we've had, what, five funerals over the last few weeks. It's been, it's been, I'm thankful for them because there's opportunity to share the gospel with people never been before. But you see, I can understand what Paul is saying. He says, you know, I, I approach the opportunity to share the gospel with a real sense of fear and trepidation because I want to make sure that what I share is the truth and I share it in such a way in God's power to work upon people's hearts and people's lives. He says, that, that's what I came for. I didn't come here as a confident orator knowing that when I'm finished, you're going to be jumping up out of your seats and coming forward to accept Christ. He says, that's not my presentation. I didn't come like that. I came to simply be a person and a vessel sharing with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I understood that I'm an imperfect vessel, but somehow, somebody, I'm asking God to work in and through me as I would. And he said, that's what I came for. He said, again, my speech was not preaching, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. In other words, I didn't sit there again and try to figure out all the techniques of how to get it done and figure out all this and inside all this kind of stuff. 
I didn't sit down here and think, okay, let's see, point A, point B, point D. Okay, I got to throw in this, I got to do in this, I got to do all kinds of things here. I mean, they taught me a lot of skills in homiletics. And uh, I remember my first professor, uh, Demon Norman Spots uh, at Clearwater, he taught us how that we use different illustrations for different reasons. I didn't know anything he was talking about. It was like brand new to me. But, you know, that's not the point and goal of sharing God's word. We just want to simply share it truthfully and simply. Paul said, I didn't figure it all out. I just came here and talked to you about Jesus Christ. He says, I wanted to come, and when I presented the truth to God, I wanted to be in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Demonstration means proof. He says, when I came and shared the gospel with these people, I wanted them to understand it wasn't my words that being spoken, it was God's words being shared. It wasn't my truth, it was God's truth. It wasn't shared in, with my skills of ability to put it together. It was shared in the power of the Holy Spirit that went forth and brought conviction upon people's hearts and people's lives. See, Paul understood. You know, man's oratory can only do so much. It can inspire people, but it can't change hearts. The only thing that changes hearts is the Spirit of God. And his truth is all that changes hearts as well. And he said, when I came there, my burden was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a way that my life was proof of how Jesus changed me. So hopefully that message would reach out to you and change your life as well. That's what he said. And throughout history, that's how God worked. Remember, we saw God uses the foolish, the rotten, the ignored people to be used by God to share his truth in a powerful way. A young man dropped out of school at 13 years of age and he wanted to make his fortune. His goal was to uh, be a shoe salesman and make as much money as anyone could possibly could. Yeah. That was his heart, his burden, his life. He loved to talk to children. He did not like to talk to adults because of his lack of education. Uh, his English was atrocious. Um, he just simply, his education didn't allow him to put sentences together that made a lot of sense. Uh, I think English teachers probably really had problems when they listened to him. He was born on a farm, moved to the city, become a wealthy man. But it didn't happen. When he died, the people who attended his funeral were told the following. Though this man made no, discover no inventions, no discoveries, he wrote no poems, painted no pictures, he led no triumphal entries, armies, this unlettered son of a poor woman in New England made an impression on the world that this dying century has seldom seen. His name was um, D.O. Moody. People heard him speak, wondered how could God use this guy? His language is atrocious. Now, I don't mean, I mean the way he phrased things together, you know, it, singular verb with the plural down. I mean, it just did not work together very well. But yet, you know, he touched England, he touched America. He found a Moody Bible Institute that's still the only institute left now in America, still going strong. And we don't have a lot of books from him either compared to Spurgeon. We, we just have him. And here's the reason why. This uneducated farm guy was used by God. He was in England one day, and he heard an evangelist Henry Varley say, the world has yet to see what God can do through a man fully yielded to him. And Dio Moody said, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. That's it. Simple as could be. I remember talking that people were asking about uh, pastors together, having a, a talk about meeting. He said, let's get Dio Moody to come and speak to our, 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 our city. And one of the guys said, why do we need Moody for? Does he have a monopoly in the spirit or something? And the pastor said, no, sir. But I tell you this. The Spirit has monopoly on D.O. Moody. How could that guy be used so greatly by God? Very simple. It was in the demonstration power of the Spirit of God. That's how it happened. He didn't come as a skilled orator. He came as a vessel filled with the Holy Spirit of God and empowered by the Spirit of God to present words that God used to go deep into the souls of people and transform lives and hearts. Paul did that. That's what we should be doing. I'm not talking about just preachers. I'm talking about every one of us as a child of God. We go out into this world around us and we're vessels of Jesus Christ to share the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we are. 
and we do so with fear and trembling. We don't know what we should say something. We don't know what we should say or how we should say it. It doesn't make any difference. We realize we're there as God's vessel, and so we just have the Spirit to work in us and use us in some way, somehow, to touch a life for him. Let them see the power of Jesus Christ in me. Let them see how he's changed my life. Let them see the difference he's made in my life. So somewhere, somewhere, we get an opportunity, I can share quickly about the gospel of Jesus Christ and let them know it's nothing complicated. It's just Jesus who's changed me, and he can change you too. Our life should be fully in the demonstration power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, you know why I get all this? Verse 5. In order that, that word that means in order that. This is my goal. This is what I wanted to see happening. Your faith, Corinthians, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He says, if I came to you and, and crafted these, or, these wonderful sermons and wonderful messages and put it all together to inspire you, he said, you would stand in my wisdom. Now they would respond to me and say, because Paul said this in this wonderful way, I'm going to believe. He said, I want to be that way. I don't want you to, to stand in the wisdom or be in the wisdom of men. He says, I want your lives to be one thing, one thing only. I want your lives to demonstrate the power of God in your life. That's it. Where power is the word dynamo, dynamite. He says, I came as a vessel by God to simply share his truth in a simple, simple fashion. So the end result would be God touching your life and changing you so people look at you and say, wow, something happened to you. The power of God exploded inside, and I can see he's made an impact in your life. That's what needs to be done. And it doesn't happen until you and I fully depend upon the Spirit to step out and live out his life and share his gospel wherever we go, whatever we do in life. One of the things that, that really saddens me about the church, and I'm speaking the modern church in general in America, okay? Very general, all right? Generally speaking, they don't depend upon the Spirit anymore. They depend upon programs and consultants and schemes to get their ministry going. Uh, that's how, how it works. Uh, I remember reading a story of a woman who was working at an a umbrella, this is years ago, a large umbrella factory in Philadelphia. It's considered one of the largest umbrella factories in the world. And she was telling her pastor, she said, I've got to go find a new job. He said, why? I said, I thought your company was doing great. She said, well, well yeah, they've got plenty of orders, and, and, and it's busy. She said, well, why do you need to find a new job? She said, well, because they don't have enough electricity to run all the machines. So I sit there half of the day doing nothing, and I don't get paid if I don't do nothing. I need to find a job, but i got to get paid for doing eight hours a day. And she says, you know the problem with my business? My problem is that they have too much machinery, but not enough power. That's like many churches today. they got tons of stuff going on, but there's no power. Because they're dependent upon the program. Dependent upon something else. They're dependent upon their skills and their imaginations, how to do things. Um, you know, I've been involved in meetings uh, um, throughout the years, particularly there when I was a professor. And we'd get together to discuss ministry, discuss the college, discuss how we could reach more people for Christ. And they don't even pray. We get together, and, and uh, sometimes we're with Dr. Kendall, and, and we get together, and boom, start me, let's go. And he and I look at him going, shouldn't we pray? I mean, we're talking about God and his ministry and impacting young people for Christ. Shouldn't we start with prayer? Finish with prayer? No. Nope. Prayer's not ever included at all. Why? Church doesn't need prayer. We need programs. We need skills. We need to have put it together. You know, I told CJ, and I, I, you know, we had a meeting Thursday night. I didn't talk to him at all about the meeting whatsoever, you know. Um, and he started the meeting in prayer. I was, I was thrilled. It was great. You know, he said, do we have any prayer requests? You know, my first thought, well, this is not Wednesday night. This is Thursday night. <laughs> Get my meetings confused a little bit here? And ask Richard to pray. But I thought, that's what's supposed to be done. We're having a meeting with Sunday school teachers, and we're going to talk about Sunday school and in the church and what we're going to be doing. We ought to pray to God first before we do anything else because he's the one that gives us the power and the wisdom to do what we've got to do, right? We're thankful to have CJ as a leader in the church and doing this kind of stuff. And, you know, we want to make some changes. We, we talk about different changes we want to do. We want to do different changes. We're going to do some different changes in worship time. We may try on Sunday. I've been trying to get it working together. Maybe a little different. Screen down, singing some words on the side, different words you're accustomed to doing. But we're not going to do anything and make any changes unless we bathe first in prayer. Asking God to give wisdom, to guidance, so that whatever we do, 
whether it's an outreach in the community or helping us to do better in Sunday school or children's church, or whatever it might be, youth work, we're doing it because this is what God wants us to do, and we're doing it in his power, in his strength, not in our own men mentality and abilities. That's how we're supposed to do church. That's how we're supposed to live this life. You know, you really can't plan, okay, today I'm going to talk to so-and-so, and this one I'm going to say A, B, C, D, because you may never meet that person that day. God may bring something completely somebody else in your life, and you have no idea for them, and it's like a shut in sock, but then something opens up, and you just simply start sharing the truth, and let it happen. I found out when I do that, that's when God really works. I remember time I went to uh, the county prison in, in Clearwater. My friend Dave Bess was on um, the prison ministry. We have ministries in Clearwater, different ministries. Um, prison, beach, all the guys wanted to do beach ministry. I don't know why, but that's what they seem to gravitate towards. But um, mission, you know, the missions and like homeless shelters and that kind of stuff. And Dave was in charge of the prison. And by this time, I was already starting to share God's word. And you share the God's word wherever you can. He said, you want to come preach in prison? I didn't really want to do that. But I said, sure. I remember I came there, and, and the guy came in to a group of guys. They're not hardened criminals. It's just a county jail. And he said, hey, these guys want to talk about God. Anybody interested? And one guy goes, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to him. So he opened the door. We walked in, locked it up, and just Dave, me, and this guy. And I had a message all prepared, but I'm thinking, okay, this isn't, this isn't the way it was supposed to work, okay? And I just started talking about God and God's love and what he did to my life. I, I didn't plan it. In fact, I can't even remember what I said, to be honest with you. But by the end, the man said, I'll accept Jesus Christ. I want his love. And I remember when we left, Dave said, wow, what just happened? I said, I don't know. He said, did you plan to do that? I said, no. I didn't plan to do anything of this stuff. No plans whatsoever. It's just that God took a hold and said, this is what you're going to do right now, okay? Just let me work, and you just listen, and just let it go. That's the best way that God works in our life, my friend. When people see the difference Jesus makes in us, they see it happening, then they will listen to the message we share, and life will be different in many different ways, shape, and form. You see, because the key of everything in our ministry, in our life, is to let people know that Jesus Christ makes the difference. We live in a culture today that has abandoned God and His truth rapidly. And there are people out there that don't even understand anything about who Jesus is. And they need to see people who love, who are kind, who are gracious, who live out God's principles day in and day out of their life, and see there's something different about you. What's made the difference? We can tell them. Jesus did. How did He do it? I don't really know how. I just know that I believed and my life was changed. And he gives me the power to follow his principles, to stand on his premise promises. And, and my life is just radically different than it's ever been before. How do I find it? Well, you just do the same thing I did. I just asked Jesus in my life. As simple as that. Really, that's that easy? It's that easy. Next thing you know, we have a life that radically changed us like yours was. You didn't plan for it. You didn't figure it all out. You didn't sit there and figure out how you're going to say anything. You just simply said, God, here I am. Fill me with your power and help me live your life for you. And they see the difference. That's what we're here for. We depend totally upon the Spirit of God every day. And as we do that, he gives us the power to do what we need to do in life. We appreciate the Gaithers and their many songs that they have written over the years. And, uh, you know, they're getting up in their ages, too. I believe Bill Gaither is in his 80s now. And... Uh, there's going to come a time where we're going to hear them going home, and of course, they'll be singing their songs that they're in heaven, I'm sure, uh, when they see Jesus. One time, Gloria Gaither wrote a song, and she wrote it because of four people. One, because a man that she knew was very bitter and angry. Um, he kind of controlled it outside, but when he got home, his anger just exploded, abused his kid, children, his wife. And one day, he was uh, invited to church and came, and a man who was sharing a song shared a testimony. And it so happened as a testimony, just like his life, how he was full of anger, full of bitterness, and then he found Jesus, and Jesus changed his life. That man came forward that night and found Christ, and his life was radically changed. His home life, completely full of love. A few days later, she attended two funerals. One was for a man who was, uh, did not know the Lord. Again, cold, hard, and angry. 
He said a few people gathered together. Not much was said because what could be said over this life? And then she went and attended another funeral. That man was a radiant follower of Christ, filled with people, joy, rejoicing among tears, but still a sense of tremendous joy because they knew the man was home with Christ. They saw how Christ impacted his life. And she said, and she thought about those lives. The man who gave her his testimony, how God changed his life, then the man who changed his life through Christ, and then this man whose life was not lived very well and no one cared, this man whose life was lived for Christ and how it touched many people for him. And so she wrote these words because she figured, what in the world is the difference between all these people? And she concluded, this is what she concluded. I'll just read the verses. You know them anyway. You'll hear them when I go through them. "'Twas a life filled with endless desperation. Without hope walked the shell of a man. Then a hand with a nail print stretched downward. Just one touch, then a new life began. Barren walls echoed hard harshness and anger. Little faces ran in terror to hide. Now those walls ring with love, warmth and laughter, since the giver of life moved inside." There's a room filled with sad, ashen faces. Without hope, death has wrapped him in gloom. But to the side of a saint, there's rejoicing for life can't be sealed in a tomb. And the old regular cross made the difference. In a life bound for heartache and defeat, I will praise him forever and ever, ever, for the cross made the difference for me. Uh, if you know Christ is Lord and Savior, that's true. That's a, we can say that cross made a difference. And all Paul is saying when he came to the Corinth, he says, I wanted to live a life that told those people the cross made a difference in me. And that's all our goal should be. And how do we do that? We depend upon the Spirit of God day in and day out and just present our lives as a vessel to him and let him work in our life as he so chooses. If we're a church like that, we may be small, but we'll still have an impact for Jesus Christ. We may be individuals who are doing the best we can, but we'll have an impact for Jesus Christ. Because that's what the church is. Real people who totally depend upon Jesus Christ. May God help us to be those kind of people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ, what it means to us. We thank you for the opportunities you give to us every single day of our life. Sometimes, Lord, sad to say we pass over them. We don't even see them there. Give us a sensitivity to see the opportunities and make the best use of them. But help us understand, Lord, it has nothing to do with us and our skills and our abilities. It has to do with simply us taking our lives, putting them into your hands, and asking for your power so we can live out your life and share your message in our life and with our words. And that people can see that Jesus has changed me. He's made a difference. And then we can share that he can make a difference in them as well. It's all it takes, Lord. One life at a time. Help us to be fully dependent upon you. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.